So good morning, all. Thank you so much for joining us for, and I'm going to mispronounce half these words, uh, Caravaggio, uh, Criminality and Baroque Drama. Uh, Caravaggio was the most uh, famous painter in Italy in the 1600s. His dark, often violent images established a dominant style for decades, and his, his own lawless lifestyle was reflected in the brutal scenes he painted. Find out more about this artist, his crimes, and his incredible influence in the world of art. So this presentation is led by art historian Jane O'Neill, who's the owner of Culturally Curious. Jane holds a master's in art from BU and a master's in education from the Harvard University Graduate School of Education. She is a New Hampshire native and has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director and the Curier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. So all 105 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jane for joining us here today. And Jane, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Robert. You're just the best. I love the energy you bring. Now I'm really pumped to do this too. So um, thank you everybody for taking time out of your day. I'm always humbled and honored to have your company right now. Um, so we are going to be looking at these intensely dramatic works for we're going to be looking at the sensational and scandalous life of the Italian Baroque artist Caravaggio, and we'll see how his work represents this dramatic departure from Renaissance painting that came before it, and how his uh, sort of idiosyncratic style came to influence art all across Europe for nearly a hundred years. We will be getting back to this very intense scene that's on, on the screen. But I wanted to give you a sense in terms of how we'll move through the material today over this next hour. And we're going to start off with an introduction to the Italian Baroque by way of a comparison really to the Renaissance. Then we'll turn our attention to our star artist today, Caravaggio. Think about how he's introducing a new realism to painting and how he uses perspective to his advantage for site-specific works. And then we'll turn our attention to his life of crime. And really, I mean, this guy got into a lot of trouble <laughs> leading up to and sort of culminating with some of the worst crimes you could possibly imagine. Um, uh, we're not going to be paying attention to this image beyond this screen, but uh, we get a little hint here of what's to come. This is uh, a scene of Abraham and Isaac over here. And then we'll wrap up with the artist's influence and legacy. So, so much to cover. Let's get started with the Italian Baroque though, because I feel like for most people, they have a pretty good understanding of what the Renaissance is all about or what Impressionism is all about, but the Baroque is a little bit out there. <laughs> it's a little bit beyond, I think, just general common knowledge. So just to get us situated, we're looking at two images from the Italian Renaissance. You might even remember Michelangelo's David from last month when we were talking about Michelangelo. Over here on the right is um, the, uh, the Marriage of the Virgin uh, uh, painting by the Italian Renaissance artist Raphael. And so these are two great emblematic images of the Renaissance, which took place, the High Renaissance, really about 100 years before um, artists like Caravaggio are, are leading the way into the Baroque period. And so when you look at these works, I want to just draw your attention to a couple of things. Over here on the left in the painting, we have this emphasis on linear perspective. Raphael is literally putting a grid on the ground here to show you that he knows how to create this illusion of space receding into depth here so that his picture looks like a window onto a world, a world that you could step right into. Notice too that he includes this architecture here, which is balanced, it's symmetrical. We have very rational shapes here um, from the curved, almost circular dome and to the half, uh, to the uh, curved arches here as well. Everything is, um, 
is based on these rational geometries. Over here with Michelangelo's David, we are reminded that when it comes to the Renaissance, artists are thinking of the classical past and, um, and thinking about ways to idealize their figure. So of course, we have Michelangelo's David looking um, like an absolute uh, uh, sort of perfect physical specimen here with a pose that's based on classical models. Uh, we also have this, this sense of balance here as well with this shift of the hips that the Italians referred to as contrapposto. So he, it, uh, he uh, Michelangelo is, is presenting this human form to us with this really kind of balanced rational composition, one leg at work, one arm at work, one leg at rest, one arm at rest. And um, just to extend along uh, this, this thread of, of what the Italian Renaissance sort of represents, and then we'll see how it changes with the Baroque one last painting from the Renaissance artist, Raphael. This is his Madonna of the Meadow from 1506. And with an image like this, we can see that the colors are bright, these really vivid reds and blues in the Madonna's robes here. And, um, and there's just enough shadow here to give us a sense of depth. It doesn't, it, so that the figures don't look overly flat. But for the most part, this is a bright, evenly lit composition. And it's incredibly balanced. The Virgin and the Christ child here and John the Baptist as a Christ, as, as a child um, are, are unified in this pyramidal shape. There's even like a pyramid within the pyramid here. So everything is based on the, you know, rational geometries, balance, proportion, shape, and idealized beauty. I mean, this Virgin here is blonde. She's lovely. Uh, it doesn't get more, uh, uh, more beautiful than this. And beyond her, Raphael has provided this gorgeous scenery. Now let's think about how all of this changes when it comes to the Baroque. We thought a little bit about the architecture in the background of Raphael's painting over here, where everything was made up of, you know, squares and, and half circles and, and rational proportions. When it gets to the Baroque, everything is about emotion. It's about surprises. You, as the visitor to a site like this, are supposed to be kind of overwhelmed by the space. So um, the walls become these kind of undulating masses. We don't have circles. We have ovals. Proportions are exaggerated. So the entire goal of, of Baroque architecture is, um, is like 180 degrees away from Renaissance architecture. When it comes to sculpture, we can see that Baroque sculptors are not as interested in just a, a static image like we saw with Michelangelo's David. This is another version of David created about 100 years later by the Baroque sculptor Bernini. And in this case, Bernini's David is, um, is a man of action. He is actually um, pulling that slingshot taut right here so that he can take down the giant Goliath. This is that consequential moment in the story of David and Goliath. And so, um, so, so really Bernini conceived of his David as something that you would see from all the way around. And that is not what we see with Michelangelo's David. You can see this is really the, um, the, the ideal perspective, the ideal view of Michelangelo's David. And you can see as you walk around it, you know, the pose sort of comes apart in terms of, you know, the balance of that composition. It's just not as satisfying. But when it comes to the Baroque and this idea of experiencing things from multiple perspectives, experiencing drama, you can see that a Baroque sculpture like Bernini's David is something that you're supposed to experience um, 360 degrees all around. We have this figure here who is coiled like a tight spring, who is ready to, to unleash all of this potential energy here. All right, so let's bring it back to Caravaggio and to painting once again. If we compare this painting by Caravaggio called The Calling of St. Matthew to, um, to this painting that we saw before by Raphael, we can see that the goals of the artists from the Renaissance and from the Baroque are completely different. First off, I think one of the things that my eye goes to is that when it comes to the Baroque, there is so much shadow. These pictures are dark, They and, and I think they, they have this moodiness to them, whereas, like I said before, Raphael and other Renaissance artists have these bright, evenly lit 
pictures with um, scenery that extends way off into the distance. When we look over at Caravaggio, it is, um, well, we have all of these figures that are sort of pressed towards the, the picture plane here. It's like a shallow stage in so many ways. And the, the theatricality kind of continues with uh, this kind of spotlight effect. Some art historians refer to this as like a cellar window effect because there's usually just this one beam of light coming into what is otherwise is oftentimes a pitch black space. So, um, so we all also see that with this comparison that Baroque artists like Caravaggio are not as interested in these beautiful saturated gem-like colors that we saw in the Renaissance. We have, um, you know, some, some, uh, some bright reds that kind of lead our eye around the picture, but it's really about this, um, this tension between light and shadow that is ruling these kinds of paintings here. And then finally, uh, when we looked at, the, at Raphael's Madonna, she was perfectly beautiful. And when we look over here at Caravaggio's painting, the emphasis is not on human beauty. In fact, we're, we're actually looking at an image of Jesus. He's this character on the far right here. And he doesn't stand out for being perfectly gorgeous. He has the faintest halo in the world. Uh, there are some figures that are, are realistic here, but for the most part, uh, we have Caravaggio going um, 180 degrees away from, from idealization. He wants to show us what real people look like. Um, in this case, Jesus to me looks like a, a, a real kind of 33 year old man. So, so we have um, this interest in, in uh, capturing what, what is observable in the natural world as opposed to creating the greatest that you can possibly imagine. So this in this moment, we have Jesus coming into uh, uh, like an accountant's office, essentially a tax collector's office. And he's ca calling upon St. Matthew and converting him to Christianity in this moment. We have the light reinforcing this dramatic conversion. We also have Jesus lifting up that hand in, um, in this way that almost seems belabored. There's almost no power behind this gesture to refer to the fact that Matthew is about to be converted. Art historians actually debate over which one of these figures is Matthew, because we can see this man here has raised his head, but he's pointing to somebody else. The light is on his face as though he is exper experiencing or about to experience a conversion. But it, I, I sort of tend to believe that it's this man um, all the way over on the left who doesn't yet realize that Jesus is in this space. The light hasn't fully hit him really. Um, and the conversion hasn't fully taken place. So, so this, this, this gesture here is probably uh, Caravaggio thinking back to uh, the Renaissance precedents of what we saw last month when we were looking at Michelangelo's work that, that, um, that gesture from Adam before he's imbued really with a human soul, with, with, um, with you know, the zest of human life really. So there's a lot here that's related to the Renaissance, but in so many ways, it is very different. But keep that name Michelangelo in mind because Caravaggio, we're looking at a portrait of him here by an artist named Leone. Caravaggio's actual name is Michelangelo Marizzi de Caravaggio. He's actually named, he has the same name as the, as the Renaissance master, but of course he is working about a hundred years later. He was born almost exactly a hundred years after Michelangelo in the year 1571. And, um, and he only lives to the age of 38. So we're going to see some incredible production during a very short time. Now we're looking at this kind of scowling face in this portrait. And it's safe to say that Caravaggio was the kind of person and the kind of artist that did not work well with others. When it came to Michelangelo, he was, you know, melancholy, he was solitary. But when it comes to Caravaggio, he is, um, he was somebody who was prone 
to um, prone to violence. He, he had a temper. He was an angry person and he, um, and he lashed out. So we'll hear a little bit more about that along the way, but let me give you a little bit of his background just to give you a sense in terms of where he was coming from. Now, most of his family, including his father, died by the time Caravaggio was just six years old. They died due to the bubonic plague. And by the time he was 11, his, um, his, his mother had died, so he was fully orphaned. Uh, but he began to study art formally around this time under a, a master painter from Milan. By the time he was 20, um, he moved to Rome and he literally had nothing, not a penny to his name. And he just had kind of intermittent employment, doing a little bit of hack work as an artist here and there. But he had this problem with rebelling against authority. He just couldn't get along with people. And he usually undermined his own success. As one art historian put it, he was given to wrath and riot. So, um, to underscore just how rough <laughs> life was in Rome. I'm showing you this image here that um, most art historians attribute to Caravaggio. There is some debate around this. This is from 1608 and it's called the tooth puller. Um, nobody wants to see a dentist these days, even with all of the modern advances and Novocaine and numbing. Can you imagine what it was like back in the 1600s? I bring in this image to remind you just how rough life was for people living in Rome in the early 1600s. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, we have people who are just curiously watching this man get his tooth pulled. Oftentimes dentistry was conducted by the same person who cut your hair. So this wasn't a specialist by any means. Now, in addition to, you know, violently getting teeth pulled out of your mouth, you have Caravaggio who is moving through the city of Rome, getting into fights. There are gangs, there are prostitutes, there are duels. It was a wild and violent time. So instead of walking you through the chronology of Caravaggio's life, I thought I would present it in um, kind of a more fun way with three big ideas that correspond to three self-portraits of the artist. So right now we are looking at a very early self-portrait of, of Caravaggio called Young Sick Bacchus. This dates to 1593. So he's only in his early 20s when he paints this. So he is painting himself in the guise of the god of wine. And this is a pretty unusual painting. It's not like an artist had never painted themselves like a Bacchus before, but in this case, he's sick. He's got this yellowy skin. He's got white lips here. He looks like he's not doing well. So this is a really strange presentation of the god of wine, the god of good times. Here he's looking like he's hung over. What a strange, what a strange notion for this artist to present and to present himself in this way. Well, we know that Caravaggio um, had actually been in the hospital for about six months before he painted this. It was due to malaria, not um, over, uh, <laughs> not over in indulging in, in, in drink. But, but keep this painting and this idea in your mind. There is this wild partier within Caravaggio, and this is going to be a continuing thread as we look at his work and consider his life. Just to give you a sense in terms of how sick he looks in this painting, picture, um, cuddling up to the grapes there. Here's another Bacchus figure that he painted from right around the same time. And you can see the flesh tone is really different. You can see that, um, that instead over here, we have this lovely plump face with the pink lips. This is somebody who looks like they're kind of thriving uh, much more than, than young sick Bacchus over here. So our next big idea uh, in terms of an introduction when it comes to Caravaggio, uh, we'll, we'll look at in this picture called the taking of Christ from 1602. The big idea here um, is that Caravaggio was an influencer. We know he was a party animal, wild party animal, and an influencer. So in the taking of Christ, this is Judas betraying Christ with a kiss and the, and the soldiers coming to take Christ away. Now in this scene, you can see a figure back here who's actually holding up a lantern. He is, um, 
he's illuminating this nighttime scene, although that lantern is not the light source in this picture. And that is uh, supposedly a self-portrait by the artist. So there's a couple of ideas happening here. Caravaggio is an influencer in the sense that almost all of his paintings are commissioned by the Catholic church. He's telling really powerful stories on behalf of the church that's trying to win back congregants away from um, Protestantism, which is really on the rise during this time. So he's influencing people with his images. But the other element of being an influencer that we see in this picture is that he is part of a mob here. He's actually kind of a one man mob. So he's influencing people in terms of his violence, his tendency towards, um, towards uh, lashing out physically to being a part of gangs. All of this criminality that is associated with his behavior as quarter is kind of wrapped up in this image as well. So um, just, okay, one last image to introduce our artist here it goes back to David and Goliath once again, instead of this beautiful um, uh, uh, adult man that Michelangelo gave us in the Renaissance, we have Caravaggio painting David as a young boy and holding up the decapitated head of the giant Goliath. So in this painting, apparently, Caravaggio used his own self-portrait for the head of Goliath here. And so the last big idea about Caravaggio, which I think we can gather from the self-portrait, is that he's a villain. And he's kind of admitting that, maybe even trying to absolve himself with a, a, a self-portrait like this within this context here. Perhaps he's even saying that he's deserving of death, um, or at least some sort of punishment for a lifetime of misdeeds. This was one of his um, much later paintings. So let's turn our attention to this notion of realism in Caravaggio's work and get a real understanding of just how different this was from everything else that was happening. We've done a good comparison between his paintings and the Renaissance, which was 100 years earlier. But what was happening right at the time that Caravaggio was painting? Well, one of the most popular styles at the time was called mannerism. This is um, a famous mannerist painting over here on the left by an artist named Parmigianino. It's called Madonna with the Long Neck. And then we actually have another Michelangelo here, a late Michelangelo from the Last Judgment fresco. Um, at the Sistine Chapel. So these are like mid 1550s. And what makes these pictures mannerist is that they have these really exaggerated proportions. Notice how long the Madonna's neck is here. Notice how strange and long the Christ child's body is. There are these weird shifts of proportion and scale with this figure down here in the background reading the scroll and this long um, kind of sexualized leg of this angel type figure attending to Mary here. Last month, we talked all about how Michelangelo loved to uh, add muscles to, to male bodies, female bodies as well, and put them in these really strange positions. All of this was to add to, to enhance the idea of what these figures were there to convey. And so Caravaggio represents a real striking contrast from this tendency in mannerism. And we're going to look at it first um, in the case of, um, of a still life. And some of his earliest paintings were still life paintings. And I remember when I first glanced at this, it didn't really captivate me, but we're gonna just spend a minute looking at this picture because it really is astonishing. So this is Basket of Fruit from 1597. And this is in a collection in Milan. This is Caravaggio entering really his professional career as an artist with a, a really striking work that is so different from mannerism, not just because we're not looking at the human body, but because he is so carefully studying his material, his, his uh, source material here, in this case, real fruit. Notice how some of the leaves from this fruit are kind of shriveling up. Some of them are kind of dying over here. There's even some um, uh, uh, little holes in them for where they've been eaten by, by insects. He also pushes this basket of fruit 
just a little bit over the edge of the table here, pushing it into our space so that it feels even more real. The, the French call this uh, a trompe l'oeil, but uh, which means to fool the eye. And it, it, it fools our brains too into thinking that this is a real basket of fruit, that that's a real wormhole in an apple. Now, this, was, uh, this is all painted with such realism that botanists today can look at these leaves and tell us what kind of insects were actually eating those leaves. That's the level of, of realism here. Uh, there's also this wonderful use of negative space that, you know, the decision to allow so much of this composition to be this kind of off-white, almost golden background. So he's doing a lot of things in, um, in a different way and they begin to really take hold. So we're going to go and transition from this one basket of fruit to the next where you can see he's doing almost the exact same thing in this detail of a painting, we'll zoom out in just a moment. Um, but this basket of fruit is also hanging over the edge of a table. It also features um, apples with wormholes and that sort of thing. Now, as we zoom out, we can see that th that same basket of fruit is, um, is kind of essential to the storytelling here. This is um, one of his most famous paintings called Supper at Emmaus from 1601. And this is really when Caravaggio is reaching the height of his artistic artistic powers. This painting is in the collection of the National Gallery in London. So let's think a little bit about realism here and how it ties into the story. Um, the Supper at Emmaus is a scene from the Gospels where, uh, where Christ, who has already been crucified, appears momentarily to two of his apostles. So, uh, and according to the gospels, he kind of appears in a changed form. So Caravaggio paints Christ without his signature beard. He looks uh, very young in this scene. And the apostles are so surprised to see him. And look at how realistic these apostles look. These are men with weathered, aged faces, torn clothes. They look like laborers in some way. You could even make the case that Christ looks slightly effeminate. And so he appears to them at this supper momentarily. They are reacting to it. Notice how Caravaggio sh foreshortens this apostle's hands as, as he stretches out his arms. And then we also have sort of the waiter <laughs> at this dinner table who um, isn't who doesn't share this vision and isn't reacting or is surprised as the apostles here. So there is so much uh, powerful storytelling going on, and it's all really rooted in um, in the detailed realism of the figures, of the items on the table. It seems like something we are witnessing in real time. And of course, it has all the other signature Baroque elements here with the, the large spotlit figures pressed uh, close to the the plane of the picture and that kind of cellar, uh, cellar window lighting here with the black background and this one kind of beam of light illuminating everything. So the realism plays a huge role. And of course, this is a religious image as so many of the pictures that we will be looking at today are. Here's another um, really kind of profoundly influential picture in um, his body of work. This is uh, called the Madonna of Loreto or the Pilgrim's Madonna. It's one of his most famous paintings. It dates to about 1606. And this picture is famous for its realism. This was a really unusual way to show the Madonna. Oftentimes she is, you know, beautifully dressed. I mean, think about uh, uh, Raphael and his perfect Madonna with her blonde hair sitting out in, in the green grass. In this case, this Madonna looks like she's living in some sort of ramshackle apartment. Notice how the walls are, um, are, are um, a little bit beat up here. She's also barefoot and she's holding this really large baby here. She does have a halo, but she looks like a real woman, a regular woman that you might see in real life. But people were really stunned by the realism of these pilgrims too. Once again, and they're aged. You, Caravaggio is showing us all of their wrinkles and perhaps most importantly, their feet, their bare, dirty feet. This is a very large painting. It would have been hung high up. And so the first thing you would have connected with are these bare, dirty feet right in your face. And so he's sparing us no, you know, no details here. He is showing us how rough life is in the 1600s by way of these religious pictures here. And this was such 
a departure from what people were used to. One last look at his uh, incredible ability to show realism and for us to consider how, um, how this ruffled a few feathers at the time too. This is one of his iconic works called The Death of the Virgin. Uh, most of these paintings are still in Italy. This one is at the Louvre in France, so you know um, it's one of the best. And it dates to the same year, 1606. Now with The Death of the Virgin, there's a lot of lore around this image, but of course in red, Lying, um, lying, lying uh, across the, the 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 picture plane here is uh, the Virgin Mary, and we can see that she she has passed away. Now, one of the, one of the elements to the lore of this picture are her feet. Uh, not quite as dirty as the pilgrim that we just saw before, but they're like these swollen feet. And, um, and so for her, for her body to be exposed in this way, in this kind of ungainly way, it was considered that, that the lore around this is that that was one of the sticking points uh, about why people didn't really like this picture. There's another story out there that perhaps Caravaggio had based uh, the Virgin Mary here on, um, on the body of a dead prostitute that he had sort of available to, to study in advance of this picture. But as it turns out, what was really the most kind of scandalous element of the realism of this picture and the Madonna surrounded by Christ's followers and their, their very apparent um, grief and sadness of her death is that it didn't really align with religious doctrine. If we think about the death of the Virgin, um, she assumes into heaven, she is assumed into heaven, uh, uh, fully formed. She, she doesn't lie around as a dead body. She goes right up to heaven and it joins her son. And so if we compare it to an early Renaissance work, this one's at the Gardner Museum in Boston, one of my favorite little paintings there. We can see this is called the Dormition of the Virgin. She's lying, uh, lifeless here, but she is, um, she's still composed. She's not, um, she's not splayed out on a table. And then we see her in the heavenly realm in this beautiful gown. And certainly we, we don't get that, that storytelling in Caravaggio's painting. This really looks like a dead woman with grief stricken followers who don't, uh, who don't know and can't imagine that she's going to be assumed up to heaven. So his approach to painting is so different um, in terms of storytelling, in terms of, of the realism of the figures. Now we're going to take a look to and consider how he uses perspective in a very innovative way. Um, we talked a little bit about sculpture and how uh, Baroque sculpture was so different from the Renaissance uh, sculpture that Bernini's David here was something that uh, the artist intended us to experience from the round. There were a number of really incredible works in sculpture that were um, that were sort of testing the boundaries of sculpture itself that might have influenced Caravaggio. This is another work by Bernini here. And, um, and it's called The Ecstasy of St. Teresa. What we can see here is a nun named St. Teresa who is having this vision where a, an angel repeatedly um, pierces her with this golden arrow of God's love. And, and it's a, an ecstatic moment for her to say the least. And we have these kind of golden rays of light coming down behind them. But that's not all that this sculpture is. This sculpture was really conceived as like a stage set. Um, within this little niche here, it looks like they're on a theater set and there's actually a window up behind this pediment over here. So real um, daylight sort of streams down those golden rays that are placed there. What's more, Bernini, our sculptor here, has even added in sculptural busts of figures who commissioned this piece uh, to kind of sit in balconies and observe this miracle uh, taking place on this stage-like setting. So thinking about how viewers engage with works is really a critical aspect of, uh, of the, the Italian Baroque. And so we're going to see how Bernini does that, or sorry, Caravaggio does that in his paintings. So we've already looked at The Calling of St. Matthew, this really powerful work that in, in this case has this light, that cellar window light kind of streaming in from the 
right side here, kind of uh, reinforcing or underscoring Jesus's decision to convert this particular uh, um, uh, tax collector. Now, its placement, and this was a, a site-specific work, its placement was designed to um, or I should say the composition was designed uh, with relationship to its, its uh, to the architecture in which it was being placed. This was created for a church setting. Um, I might butcher the name of it. It's called San Luigi uh, Dia Fr uh, Fr Freschi in Rome. And it, this was painted in the 1600s uh, or right around 1600. And so this is a church where you would walk in. This is like the main nave of the church. This is a, the corresponding plan. And the nave has these side aisles where people can walk. If you have really good eyes, you might be able to see them over here. Now, all along the side aisles are these side chapels. And it's in these areas where um, Caravaggio often painted site-specific works. These are tight spaces that are not um, that, that are not accessible to the general public. They come up to these little gates here and they can kind of peer in. And oftentimes Caravaggio's paintings are on the side walls in these chapels. That is exactly where his um, calling of St. Matthew is. So you're peering in over here into this little side chapel. There's a painting directly across from you. But as you peer further in, there's the calling of St. Matthew, and there is natural light that comes from above and sort of echoes the light in the painting over here. This is not a painting that most people would ever get the chance to stand right in front of. So instead, Caravaggio is thinking about how he can sort of optimize or maximize the setting here and the natural light to underscore the storytelling that he's incorporating. Now we're going to see how he does this with a couple of other religious images. This is such a powerful image. It's called the Entonement of Christ from 1603. This is um, also at uh, in um, a, a little chapel area in a church in Rome. But what's happening here obviously is uh, several, uh, is a group of mourners here who have have Christ's body after the crucifixion, and they are lowering it. Oftentimes we think of the entombment as, um, as they're putting him in a cave or putting him in a grave. In this case, they are putting him on this stone. It looks like a cut stone uh, with this angle here that is poking out into our space. So another kind of Trump loy moment. We've got the stark black background, the stark white body of Christ um, sort of spotlit for us here um, in this theatrical way and the heightened realism of um, these wrinkled and aged uh, uh, religious followers here who are lowering his body. And then we have the three Marys in the background who are responding to this. Now, this is another site-specific work in front of this little altar within this specific church where they would bless the host for, um, for communion. And so this sort of underscores this important Catholic principle of transubstantiation. So when a Catholic priest says, you know, this is the body of Christ, he would do this little blessing right here in the altar, uh, at the altar in front of this painting, holding up the host, connecting it to the body of Christ right above him. So Caravaggio is doing really smart things to connect his paintings to the architecture, and in this case, to the rituals within this church. Now he's going to use perspective in some really astonishing ways for this next little chapel that we're looking at. He has two paintings within this one chapel. This is another conversion painting. We already saw the conversion of, um, of Matthew. This is the conversion of Paul on the way to Damascus. This was painted for um, the church Santa Maria del Popolo in 1601. So again, right really at the height of his artistic powers. So so in this conversion scene, Jesus isn't there. He's not raising sort of a lazy hand to um, to convert someone. Instead, he has um, he 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 has, well instead Caravaggio shows us this scene as though it's just this kind of magical mystical light that is converting um, Saul into Paul. We have him lying here on the ground. He's been knocked off this horse. He was prior to this moment of conversion. He was a, a zealous Pharisee. He had been persecuting followers of Jesus. But in this moment, as he's knocked off his horse and is lying on the ground with his arms up in the air, he is uh, he's embracing 
literally the light of God. And this is such a remarkable conversion. It's a strange painting. It looks like he's about to be trampled by this horse in some ways. And we've got this kind of uh, um, older man with you know the wrinkled face who is, is getting the horse under control. But look at the way Caravaggio paints this body of Paul, Saul slash Paul here, kind of projecting out into our space or towards our space at this dramatic angle here. And that is really reinforced by the placement of this particular painting. This is a plan for the church Santa Maria del Popolo. And this painting is actually in this section here that's labeled number 10. And it's right along this wall here. So you as, as a visitor could go up here, but really can't cross this line. You can just peer into this chapel and you would see um, uh, this conversion scene with this figure who looks like he's extending out towards you. Caravaggio knows that you'll never stand right in front of this picture. So he paints it in such a way that it feels like you can connect with it, that it feels like it's making an impact on you. Now, the next uh, image that he created for this tiny little chapel here, it's not the central image, it's directly across from uh, the conversion of Paul. And it is the crucifixion of St. Peter. So it's done in the same year, 1601. And St. Peter, of course, was uh, essentially the, the first pope. He was given the keys to the kingdom. And, um, and when he uh, was martyred, he was crucified upside down. And so we can see this horrific scene with um with an elderly saint peter whose body is again kind of spotlit by this theatrical lighting uh nailed to this cross and we can see these three men in the process of raising this cross so it's all happening at this uh unusual and dramatic angle uh with his feet sort of pointing almost out of the picture itself um his feet with the nails impaled through them and just as as a reminder, we as the viewer would be seeing it pretty much from this angle. So we, his feet are kind of closest to us. It's a dramatic storytelling, but it's all um, painted at this angle that sort of suits the, the architectural space and the fact that as viewers, we would be seeing it from such a strange angle. So here is kind of a wide shot where you can see both of these images that Caravaggio has painted in a way that they seem to reach out towards you as the visitor. Um, here is just another view of it from from further back, you can see you really have to be standing right up against this gate in order to get any view of these images. And Caravaggio wanted to make these images jump out at you. All right, so we can see how he's using perspective and really trying to engage uh, visitors and viewers with these scenes. And remarkably, they've been in the same place for over the last 400 years. Now let's turn our attention to Caravaggio's life of crime. <laughs> I love a good true crime story, don't you? Now, um, it's amazing to think that this person who is working in service of the Catholic Church is so embroiled in crime himself, but it's something that we see really throughout his life. And once again, I'm going to use his own pictures to kind of underscore how, um, how his crimes get increasingly more severe. So we're going to start off with a fairly early work here. This is 1594. It's called The Card Sharps. And this work is actually in America. It's at the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. So we are, of course, seeing people cheating at cards. I love Baroque paintings of people cheating at cards. They're just really fun images to kind of take apart. So we see, you know, this well-dressed young boy, beautiful face, sort of effeminate again. And we see these two tricksters who are ready to take him for all he's worth. So there's uh, one man standing behind him who's eyeing the cards with this kind of big bulge eye and signaling to his partner who has a few cards tucked into the back of his clothing here so that he can, you know, put together a winning hand. Now, in my estimation, this is petty crime, right? I mean, this is just, you know, what's in a man's wallet on, on a certain day. And Caravaggio himself kind of started off with smaller crimes. Um, he was, for instance, uh, brought to court for libel uh, because he was saying such horrible things about an artistic rival of his. He was actually wrote it in poetry form. And now this doesn't sound so bad, but it was like peppered 
with obscenities. It was really kind of the worst of the worst that you could communicate. Uh, think of it as the equivalent as, of as like online bullying, really. So he he was uh, uh, truly offensive with his language as it related to um, to a rival of his. But you know, still comparatively speaking, low level crime. Here's just another image, just to show a little bit for, uh, of Caravaggio's influence. This is a, a similar painting that was done by a French artist named. Latour. We'll, we'll see, I think, a few more card sharks today, too. Uh, one more image of petty crime created by Caravaggio early on in his career. This is called The Fortune Teller. It dates to 1599, and this is also at the Louvre Museum. So this fortune teller, this lovely young woman who has locked eyes with this well-to-do young boy, is sort of fingering his palm, you know, telling him what his fortune will be, what will his life look like. But if you have very good eyes, she's actually pulling a ring off of his finger. And so she is, you know, making away with, with a little treasure of her own in this particular image. This is just a good reminder that, that Caravaggio's life started off with these kind of minor offenses. Um, but it escalates and it gets violent pretty quickly. Uh, in this case, we are looking at a decapitated head, but it's a myth mythological figure. We are, of course, looking at Medusa. And this kind of corresponds to the fact that for Caravaggio, he was getting into trouble for act uh, carrying around a sword when he shouldn't be. Uh, there were all these offenses that took place at like two or three o'clock in the morning in Rome. He's getting into fights. He's threatening people with these swords. Things are not looking good. He is um, also, uh, you know, just acting out against people that he shouldn't. He, there's a famous story of how he was at a restaurant and he threw a plate full of artichokes at a waiter. Doesn't sound that awful, but if you were sitting in that restaurant and you saw somebody throw their food at a waiter, yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty um, antisocial behavior, right? So we see this kind of violence escalating in his artwork too. In this case, Medusa's head is painted on this convex shield. And so we have all of the, um, um, all of the wonderful detail of, of Medusa's snake, well, hair that is snakes, and then the horror of her expression as her head has just been um, uh, uh, disconnected from her body, and then the gore of the blood pouring out down below. So Caravaggio is not afraid to kind of escalate the, the kind of violence that he is painting. And perhaps the most famous violent painting that he ever created is his depiction of Judith and Holofernes. This is this was painted in 1598. Now this is a religious uh, subject, and it was probably, um, well, almost certainly commissioned for. Um, religious purposes as well, but it's a bloody subject. It's a beheading. And in this case, uh, Judith was sort of a, a heroine. Uh, her, her, uh, 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 her community, her town was being held hostage. There was a siege. And so she went to Holofernes, the general's tent of the opposing army and seduces him, gets him drunk. And when he falls asleep, she takes his head off. And, um, and Caravaggio is doing this with his typical bag of tricks. There's a dark and shadowy background. The figures are right pressed against the picture plane with these spotlit uh, bodies, almost you know, white pale skin here. And um, we have the, the, this dramatic moment with the blood spilling out from, uh, from Holofernes neck here. Now, all of this kind of culminates to the fact that Caravaggio himself was involved in a homicide, um, sort of like we see here. Now, there's a, a lot of different interpretations or understandings of what exactly happened. He did um, cause the death of another man in 1606. Uh, oftentimes, people say it was a dispute over a tennis match, which makes it sound so genteel, genteel in some ways. But um, but uh, there's another theory out there that they were actually fighting over a woman, and that woman may have been a prostitute. In any event, it caused Caravaggio to flee. He had to leave town. He got out of Rome and then um, finds himself uh, in Malta a few years later, where he creates this final major masterwork before his own untimely death, sort of perhaps speaking to um, the violence that he uh, uh, 
uh, exhibited throughout his life. So this, this is a painting called The Beheading of John the Baptist from 1608. It is 17 feet long. It's a major painting. And it is, um, I, I mean, for many art historians, one of the greatest paintings of all time. So what is happening here is that John the Baptist has been pulled out of prison so that, um, so that uh, Salome could get, get uh, his head <laughs> uh, to deliver his head. And we have the jailer here who is involved with severing uh, uh, St. John the Baptist's head here. Now, St. John the Baptist was known to wear animal skin. So that's what you sort of see peeking out from the robes. We have prisoners who are still in the jail cell who are observing this violence. You know, imagine just pulling a prisoner out of their cell and into this shadowy alleyway here. We have the physical force of the jailer pushing John the Baptist down. Um, another figure here pointing to this golden bowl uh, where the head will be placed, it sort of functions as like a detached halo in some in some ways. An older woman with her hands pressed to the sides of her face, once again emphasizing the, the idea of what's about to happen to, to John the Baptist, and then this younger woman here who is ready to receive it. Uh, now, interestingly, there is some blood being spilled here. I'm going to zoom in on that detail because there's some text there along with the blood. And it is understood by many that, um, that the text here says, I Caravaggio did this, or really Michelangelo Caravaggio did this, as though it is like a confession of some crime right there in his signature. Um, this is up to, up to a matter of debate, but this is a man who had committed his own murder just a few years earlier. Now, Here's just one more view of this painting um, uh, in its site-specific work. And so you get a sense of the scale here. It would be a, a really powerful way for this artist to try and maybe even absolve some of his, his lifetime of sins here. But he himself faced his own untimely death. We know that he died of an infection in 1610. Um, most historians think that he was probably um, probably murdered and then sort of it was a long, slow death. So uh, so the man who took other people's life by a sword probably died by someone else's sword too. So we'll wrap things up very quickly uh, with Caravaggio's influence and legacy. So there he is once again. What did this man actually do beyond um, get into a lot of fights and create some really powerful pictures? Well, Interestingly, he was almost completely forgotten right after he died. He never had his own workshop. He never had students. He wasn't teaching people how to do what he did. And yet, incredibly, his style just proliferates and it spreads all over Europe. So very quickly, I just want to show you how other artists are, are really copying what he's doing, taking off from it. So about 20 years after his Judith and Hall of Fairness, we have the Italian Baroque uh, artist Artemisia Gentileschi painting her own. It probably would have never happened without Caravaggio's model over here. We saw, um, his beheading of John the Baptist. This is another version um, uh, over here on the left. And on the right, we have another Italian Baroque artist version from about 10 years later. But uh, again, the formula here is so, um, it, well, the formula and, and, and the, the mimicry is, is so clear. You know, the, the figure groupings, the subject matter, uh, these artists were looking at Caravaggio's work and taking, taking a note. We have more card sharks. Uh, this became a hugely popular subject throughout the Netherlands and France. Um, in this case, this is a, a French take on card sharks, uh, sharps and, and cheating at cards over here. Always a, a fun subject, but this one was painted almost 25 years after Caravaggio's painting over here. And then just a few images of um, St. Francis of Assisi. This was a favorite subject for um, Caravaggio and Spanish artists like uh, Zerberan over here took it up as well. We're so lucky that we have this incredible Caravaggio painting of St. Francis of Assisi right down in Hartford at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, one of my favorite museums of all time. And this is a, a 
very large scale painting, beautiful, dramatic in every way. So, um, so we'll finish up with just a little bit more about Caravaggio's legacy. Uh, one of his paintings was actually stolen from a church in Palermo. It was a nativity scene that we see over here with several saints in attendance. It was stolen, I believe it was back in the 1960s. It's still one of the top art crimes in the world. Um, this is what uh, the, the church looked like without their beloved Caravaggio there. I think they've replaced it with a copy, but it's still an open case. We don't know where this painting ended up. And these Caravaggio paintings rarely go on the market. So this was this would be an incredibly valuable work, although um, art, uh, art experts believe that it was almost certainly damaged or severe, severely damaged or destroyed just by removing it from its location. Every now and then a Caravaggio painting is sort of discovered, uh, in this case in an attic in France, and, um, and the speculation for how much will be paid for these kinds of images is always like these soaring estimates. And so this, um, this sort of recently discovered Caravaggio apparently went for more than a hundred million dollars, uh, a really kind of grotesque take on the more familiar <laughs> uh, Judith and Holofernes over here. So uh, unbelievable prices because his, I mean, people are really fascinated by his pictures. We will end today with two images that we haven't had a chance to look at, but I wanted to give you a really good sense of the scope of his work. This is a boy being bitten by a little lizard. So you can see over here, there's all this shock in response to that. And this is Narcissus falling in love with his own reflection in the water. And so I wanted to end with these two images because I think in so many ways they represent what Caravaggio does for us. There's shock and alarm like we see over here on the left. But then there's also something that's totally awe-inspiring, as we see over here on the right. Caravaggio's work and life story are still completely arresting today. So I will end there for now, and I welcome any questions or comments that you have about the artist or about his crimes. I haven't committed all of them to memory, but I can try to flesh out anything that you're curious about. So thank you, everybody, for staying with me for the past hour. And, um, and I'll see if I can get any of your questions answered here. All right, and I'm looking at Donna's question. In the opening slide, I see a person on the right breaking a stick using his leg. There must be some kind of hidden meaning to the action. The opening slide, is it this one? but I don't see a stick. So maybe I'll, I'll scroll back through there and see if I can get back to that, Donna. Let's see, Diane asks, is there any record of Caravaggio having any romantic relationships with women or men or any children? Um, Diane, I don't, I'm not aware of, the, of uh, any children that he might've fathered, but I think he had um, a number of relationships with women, primarily prostitutes from what I understand. And Teresa asked, were all of his paintings commissioned by the Catholic church? Uh, for the most part, I, I think almost all of them were. Uh, occasionally, there there might have been a portrait here, here, or there, but um, but they were his primary um, his primary patrons. And so uh, I'm going to see if I can go back to Donna and see if I might be able to find something where somebody is breaking something over their leg. I'm not sure if I can see that. Um, Sorry, Donna, I'm just not sure if I can see that in any of these pictures here. But if you if you have any more details about which image that was, maybe I can help you with that. Um, let's see, going through some of these questions in the chat. Uh, do we know anything about his models? Great question, Emily. Uh, I have a feeling that they were people that he found on the street as much as possible. They would have been cheap, available, and they would have been they would have been these people with the dirty hands and the dirty feet and the swollen ankles. Um, really. Um, the kind of poor people that Jesus and his followers actually were, but were considered so um, so unusual and really kind of egregious uh, to his contemporary audiences because they weren't, they, they didn't look like the perfect, the divine figures that had been painted uh, for hundreds of years. So really uh, essentially street people. Um, 
as an orphan, did he have any relatives, Regina asks. Uh, I believe uh, almost his entire family was killed by the bubonic plague. Uh, I don't know if he had any distant relatives, but I, I, I don't even think he had any siblings. I think uh, he pretty much lost everybody very early on. It doesn't seem like he had any family connections that he sustained. Um, let's see. Oh, it's the wedding scene. Let's see if I know which one we're talking. Oh, the wedding scene. Oh, okay. Um, here we go. The breaking of the stick. Good question. <laughs> Um, I, I, I'm not sure about that. My first thought is like the Jewish tradition of like smashing a glass and saying, you know, in, until all the, the pieces of the, of the glass come together, you know, let's, uh, I, uh, we hope that this marriage lasts that long. So maybe it's a, this idea of like, you destroy something small like that to sort of say, you know, until this comes back together, may this marriage last that long. I, I honestly don't know. I'm just speculating there. So that could be what's happening. I'm not sure. Um, an anonymous attendee says, when I was in Italy, the feeling towards Caravaggio was that he was a genius, but not well-liked or respective. It was a slightly dismissive feeling. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, it could be because, uh, I mean, personally, he did, I mean, he did not get along with people. He got into so much trouble. I'm not sure if there was something else underneath that the, uh, the sort of dismissive feeling that that you that you have there I, I think that there's new really kind of surging interest in Caravaggio particularly in the past decade because his life was so salacious um, you know there's so many artists out there that just you know have their painting or their sculpture and they just do their job and it doesn't make them entirely interesting to, to, to uh, look at in, in great depth. But when you have an artist like this, whose, um, whose artwork kind of matches the, um, well, revolutionary artwork sort of matches the violent nature of the artist himself. It's, um, I think it, it's really good fodder for, um, for research and for writing. So I, I, I wonder how long ago, maybe you were in Italy, maybe things have changed in the past decade. Emily says, I've heard that Caravaggio was gay. Any truth to that? And if so, any reflection in his art of this orientation? Um, I don't know offhand if that is correct, but I will say he certainly had an interest in painting <laughs> sort of slightly effeminate young men. There's a lot of images like this, even at the supper at Emmaus where Christ appears at the table without a beard. Um, that was another sort of effeminate young man. And these are really uh, sensual images. In this case, this is a big black bow that's kind of holding his toga together and he's fingering it as though he's about to disrobe right in front of us. So there's this incredible sensuality to these scenes. And I think um, you could extend that to Perhaps there, uh, perhaps uh, that was the direction that Caravaggio uh, was interested in. Uh, but uh, you know, I I don't, I can't say for sure. It does seem like like female prostitutes were a part of his life as well. Um, Catalina asked, "Did Caravaggio see financial success during his lifetime?" He most certainly did. I mean, he probably squandered a lot of what he made, <laughs> but these are very large commissions that he was getting from the church. Some of those, particularly some of those site specific works in the chapels, I mean, those were like 10, 12 foot high paintings. These would have taken a long time to execute. The materials necessary for them would have been expensive. And I expected that he would have been rewarded handsomely for them. Um, Teresa asked, may I, ha I may have missed it, when was he born and how did he train to become a painter? He was born in 1571 and shortly after he was orphaned, he went to study with a master painter. I'm sorry, I don't have that artist's name. Just, I didn't include it in my notes because I don't think it was an artist that, that most people would recognize. There was a master painter in Milan that he trained with and then he ended up going to Rome on his own. Anne says, breaking the glass by stomping on it is related to the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem. Thank you for adding that, Anne. I think that sort of fleshes out what I was uh, attempting to say there. Uh, do I think he was, I think the, the intention here is to say schizophrenic maybe. I have a feeling he was a little bit of a sociopath. I don't know, I, I, I mean, I can't diagnose him, but I, he was, 
he couldn't stay out of trouble. He couldn't get out of his own way. And he was certainly prone to violence. So I think that there, he, he was troubled to say the least. And I tend to think that maybe the answer there is, is like a sociopath. Um, and Harvey asked, was he responsible for all the paintings in the church? For the most part, no, there's, there's no like single church where he painted everything. You're going to have to go to Rome and go to a lot of churches if you want to, if you want to see these works in real life. He typically would just do, you know, one or two pictures in a side chapel, uh, but it's a really good excuse to, to poke around in, in all of these old churches in Rome if you'd like to go see them in real life. And then I think there's one last question here, maybe. Okay. Um, well, we have something today. I'm so excited to share this with you because this is like uh, everything lining up. There's a synchronicity here that just works out really well. Tonight, I am debuting a new program on a photographer, a, a modern female photographer named Cindy Sherman. And believe it or not, her, she has spent the past 50 years or so dressing up in different guises, completely transforming herself and taking photographs of it. She is... Um, She's a, a, a real character and her works are fantastic. Well, she has actually dressed up as the young, sick Bacchus. And so I feel like this is a great segue to say, if you're interested in Cindy Sherman, join me tonight at seven o'clock for that one. You can go to my website, IamCulturallyCurious.com. And there is a calendar page and a link to tonight's program. I believe that's with um, the Paul Pratt Memorial Library in Cahasset, Massachusetts. So, so Caravaggio is just kind of serving this up for us in so many ways. So thank you again, everybody, for joining today. Thanks for all the great questions and for your attention. Thank you, Robert, for hosting. I always love working with you and your community. Yeah, no, uh, Jane, wonderful job as always. We will see Jane again next month on Thursday, November 10th at 11 o'clock. So the day before Veterans Day, uh, she'll be with us to give her, her presentation, Heroes and Homecomings, Norman Rockwell and World War II. So that is coming up uh, in, in about a month. So looking forward to that, always looking forward to Jane, always a pleasure to work with Jane. Uh, we'll be seeing Jane in December as well. Um, and so folks, I'll look for an email tomorrow, maybe even this afternoon, uh, with a link to a feedback survey, a link to this recording, and information ab about a bunch more uh, virtual art history programs, as well as the Reading Rivals competition, in case you wanna help out Tewksbury. So Jane, uh, thank you so much as always, and we'll see you in about a month. Have a good one. Take care, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Good luck with your event tonight, Jane. Bye-bye. Thank you.